We're going to talk a little bit about how robots learn, but more specifically, perhaps, um, well, how autonomous vehicles or self-driving vehicles. Let me begin with uh, sort of our conception of what it means for a robot to learn or even to just know anything. Uh, people are often mystified when we say, you know, a robot is learning and, and people say, no, only, only children can learn, only people can learn. What's a robot doing? Maybe the first question to ask is, what does a robot need to know in order to do anything useful? So you mentioned self-driving cars. What do we need to know as a car in order to be able to drive? We need to know what is a road, what is not a road, what is an obstacle, what's not an obstacle, which is literally the very minimum you must know before you can do anything at all. The robot must know how the car behaves. So what happens if I press this pedal? What happens if I turn the steering wheel a little bit? So these are all physical systems, if you like, of one kind or the other. How the car behaves is literally what we are taught in high school physics. So the robot must have some idea of high school physics. We don't mean make a robot sit there and learn like we did, but, but some of that information about what will happen if you do something must be in the robot. Likewise, uh, the robot needs to understand, you know, if I see the, these kind of perceptions, it, it must be the road. And, and it needs to be uh, able to do this robustly, you know, under rain, under snow, uh, under all of these conditions, lighting. So these are all, uh, you know, bits of knowledge that the robot needs. Likewise, uh, you, you also need to know uh, as the robot, what will somebody do if I do this? You know, when somebody starts to break and you see their brake light, what should I expect? Just as what should I expect if I press this pedal? And then once you understand that, then you say, okay, if I expect this, then what can I do? So maybe I can cut in front of this person because they have slowed down. Uh, maybe I can indicate to see if they let me in and so on and so forth. So the knowledge gets more and more sophisticated until at the, at the very limit, you're trying to ask what kind of a person am I facing? And all of this is knowledge. So when we say a robot learns, what we mean is that the robot has some kind of a representation of these bits of knowledge. It could be a map, it could be a function that says, if you do this, this will happen. Uh, and then what the robot is doing is changing something in the representation to better fit what it sees in reality. That's what learning is. In any industry, they have the saying, rubbish in, rubbish out. So how much information do you need to feed these before they can make some kind of sense of it? I mean, because we are talking about cars and how they learn, it's very interesting because at the moment, uh, the, the, the biggest barrier that the industry as a whole faces is to get enough data to represent everything. At one level, if you're thinking about what's the minimum you need to learn uh, or you need to know in order to get started, it's not a whole lot. <laughs> Uh, in fact, I mean, uh, think about it this way. So we have, uh, you know, high school students come in for weekend hackathons and we get them to take Lego, Lego robots and follow a line on the, uh, you know, on the floor. Uh, and it's not that hard. Uh, it's, so people can put these together uh, in, a, in a more serious note. Uh, it's an undergraduate project to get a car to just follow the road somewhere. But that's not what we are talking about when we say self-driving cars. What, what we're really talking about is a car that can cope with multiple conditions, multiple environmental kind of behaviors, different actors on the road, unknowns in the form of, you know, maybe a paper bag flying in front of you. And is that a rock or is it just a paper bag that I can drive through? By the time you're talking about all of this, you need an enormous amount of data. Or you need some way in which people can teach you efficiently. So when we were taught how to drive, we were leveraging common sense that we had learned over a lifetime. But also people gave us rules. So people told us, you know, uh, make sure that you're, you know somebody else is not in your way. And and they, they didn't just show you one or two examples. They gave you this high level instruction that covered a lot of things. So sometimes that's how you get good data. It's it's a combination of all of these. There's obviously got to be a huge amount of processing going on here as well. How do you deal with that amount of data and how, you know, the amount of processing that's required? With a lot of care uh, and with a lot of resources. Uh, so in terms of resources, so, so to give you uh, an example, if, if you drove around a car with, I mean, let's say, eight cameras and radar and LiDAR units, and if you drove it around all day, nine to five, by the end of the day, you'd have accumulated enough information that you wouldn't use Wi-Fi or something to transmit it. You would unplug the hard disk and, you know, plug it back in. That's the level at which uh, information is going to be collected. Uh, one can be clever about this. This is what computer science is about. So one can curate, compress, 
and all of that. Uh, but ultimately, uh, what you really want is many, many months and years of campaigns like this in many places, all of that compressed and distilled. Um, and that's what the frontier of machine learning today is. I'm just imagining those gigabytes of data and, and what what you do with them. But I mean, presumably a lot of the processing has to happen in real time. And then what you're talking about is perhaps analyzing that information, is it? The acquisition has to be real time because you don't know at runtime what is useful and what is not. But we are not the first uh, kind of industry uh, in robotics to think about this. So if you take as an example what's going on with these big particle accelerators, they're doing exactly the same thing. You know, they, they uh, conduct this experiment. They don't know what happened. Uh, it, 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 everything happens so fast that they're collecting terabytes of data for you know, fractions of a second. Uh, and then th they have a, a, a high resolution, very fast layer that quickly does a basic level of processing. And all of the analysis happens afterwards. So it would be a little bit like that in this pipeline as well. It's definitely not the first time I've said it, so apologies if you're bored of hearing this. But it seems to me that the, the big problem with anything that's autonomous is actually mixing it with things that are not autonomous. If you change everything overnight to be autonomous, you just implement some rules and off you go. But how do you make sense of a world where some things are not acting in the same way you do? <laughs> This is exactly what is making this problem interesting because, as you say, if, if all vehicles on the road were autonomous, if there were no people running around and there were no kids jumping in front of you, the problem is much simpler. Then we really have just the TCP IP protocol for your computer uh, uh, just running on physical uh, you know, packets, and, and that would be much simpler. It, it, it wouldn't be trivial, but we understand those problems. What makes this problem hard is exactly that you need to understand what is the person in front of me doing if I see this. If I think this is what they're doing and I do this, what will they do? Uh, and all of the, that, that complexity is what the robot needs to cope with. Uh, the way we do it in practice is that we take a combination of behave a little bit conservatively, you know, assume that the other person, uh, you know, might be doing things you don't fully understand. Assume if you're going in a school zone that a kid could you know, jump in front of you. So uh, act a little bit conservatively is a good uh, starting heuristic. Uh, and the second is to learn over time. In the beginning, maybe we don't know what people are doing, but after a while, you've seen enough number of instances that maybe some of these things aren't a surprise anymore. Uh, and over time, slowly, you've uh, understood all of what we call edge cases different countries people behave in different ways so would these uh, autonomous vehicles have to be localized in some way they would we are quite far away i think uh, from the point when country level kind of behavioral nuances matter because there, there are much bigger problems that are still unsolved uh, there certainly are differences so one prominent difference so uh, I spent many years living in the US and then now I've spent many years living in the UK. And, and a big difference is, uh, you know, walking on the uh, on the street, a jaywalking, as it's called, is illegal in most parts of the US, but it's not illegal in the UK. And in fact, we have a completely different approach to transportation regulation on that front. Uh, this makes a big difference for the car because you can make certain assumptions in one setting that you cannot make in another setting. Uh, and also the importance of do you need models of how people behave uh, changes because of this. Uh, so like this, there are a number of differences. Uh, so if you are in a uh, you know, suburban environment where lane discipline is all you need, driving is a lot simpler. If you're in a tight urban setting in which you have to squeeze your way in and things like that, driving is much harder. And I know that um, there are trials going on. There are places where you can use autonomous vehicles or at least in a limited fashion but just before you mentioned that there are still some unsolved problems so what, what are the biggest um, unsolved problems in this area i think what people are struggling with is this business of edge cases uh so so uh at one level, the way it manifests itself is that when something slightly odd happens, 
you know, somebody didn't stop the way you thought they should, or maybe people double parked in a way that you weren't expecting. These things can confuse the system because it hasn't been trained in quite that setting. I think most road trials and most serious players have gotten past this. These kinds of problems have been solved. But the next level of problems now is, you know, how do you interact with people in a meaningful way? Uh, so one of my students uh, and I, we recently wrote a paper in which we were arguing that, uh, you know, the act of driving is fundamentally an act of conflict. Uh, anybody who's seriously driven would immediately agree. Uh, it, it may, you know, it, it may not seem that way uh, up front, but, but that's naturally what it is. You know, every time we give way, every time, you know, somebody pushes in a, just a little bit faster so that they go first, uh, they're all situations of conflict, mild conflict. I, I mean, nothing too bad, but, but it's still something that the agent must learn to deal with. Uh, in turn, this calls for uh, interesting mathematical techniques. So th th there are fields like game theory that uh, try to describe these kinds of phenomena. And so uh, uh, one could look at how do you bring those kinds of constructions along with you know, modern data-driven machine learning, uh, reasoning methods. So people are looking at a variety of ways in which one could tackle this. The edge cases we're, we're sort of getting, getting beyond. But I mean, I suppose there are there are edge cases where humans fail and make problems. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any accidents on the road or collisions. Um, what is the holy grail in this field? What what is it that everyone's striving to to solve? So people are struggling to say what it means to be competent. Some of it is actually social acceptance and political realities. Uh, so, so there needs to be a conversation at the societal level about, you know, now that these technologies are looking serious, what do we want? Uh, I don't think that conversation has fully happened yet. Uh, so for the longest time, this was just quaint technology happening in a few places. Uh, then it got picked up in the political circles as this is emerging technology. But I, I think we still have not had conversations sitting down with the lay person. Uh, you know, ultimately, the people who are going to be affected are people who don't even know what this technology is, you know, kids and elderly and so on. Uh, so that conversation has to happen for one version of this answer. Uh, but, but if you kind of think about it in terms of what do the engineers and the technologists think is the holy grail, I would say... At the minimum, we would like, uh, you know, robust uh, autonomy in uh, what we call, you know, operating design domains that are large enough. You know, so right now one might say we only drive if it's sunny or we only drive between nine to five. Uh, and that's OK. And you could imagine kind of operating vehicles like this. But we want these conditions to be reasonably permissive, that it's useful, it's economically useful. Uh, and we're not quite there because, it, you know, in, in in the UK, if you said, I'm only going to drive if it's sunny, you're not going to run a very useful business. Uh, so you, you have to be able to at least cope with weather conditions. And then you have to be able to cope with traffic conditions. Then you have to cope with seasonality. Um, so the, so the, the holy grail is really to be able to include all of this in the design domain. There's a slightly out there question I want to put to you that some of these... Um cars um, vehicles have got so much computation on is it not more efficient just to have a human sitting there this is an excellent question at, at the moment uh i would say that a lot of that computation is there because we don't know how to solve the problem in a cleverer way uh also a lot of that computation is just commercial grade you know regular computers that have been put there because nobody has built a special purpose unit for people who are serious, I mean, a, a very good example is Tesla, where they've uh, expended an enormous amount of effort to make it a product that's compact and kind of sellable, and, and they've made good progress. Um, uh, so like that, I, I think when when the full uh, you know uh, manufacturing enterprise is dedicated to this problem, some of this will get better. So we'll have uh, Raspberry Pi running our... Uh that I do not know. Uh, what, what I would really expect is that, you know, the, the big players, whether it's an NVIDIA or an Intel or whoever the new entrant is, uh, I would not be surprised if, uh, uh, you know, they, they all don't have plans for how exactly you're going to come up with an embedded systems platform that is more compact than what's going around. So if you looked at some of the early days of uh, autonomous driving, they just you know, PC units, uh, you know, bought from commercial suppliers and just stacked in the back. 
so clearly that's not how you want to run this. Uh, 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 but, but that's also clearly just a matter of the big players not having done something for it. One of the classic things to ask anyone who's talking about any technology is, does it ever go wrong? Um, and it's kind of, we, we read in the newspapers occasionally that some of these trials go wrong. Does it, uh, putting to side the, you know, the, the tragic cases where it go, goes horribly wrong, what's the sort of thing that it, it just gets slightly wrong? Is there something that, that just continually crops up? It does. And, and in fact, those are the more interesting ones. To give you a very trivial example, hesitation at roundabouts. Uh, so you might have a car uh, you know, that wants to acquire enough information and, and only then enter a roundabout. But if you, uh, if you look carefully, they look like you know, student drivers who annoy everybody on the road. right? And, and they're not quite going in. And you're like, you, know, you can go now. I would have gone. But then the car doesn't go. And if you're in a dense enough area, this might mean that you hold up traffic. Uh, this is not quite called a failure in public discussion, but it is a failure. And until you can solve these kinds of problems, you're not going to get acceptance. But I suppose that different autonomous vehicles could communicate with each other and make, is that how it would work? It could work. This is an issue that's not explored nearly enough, but uh, I'm beginning to think more and more that it's only a matter of time. Uh, It's only really a matter of time before something like this also comes in. Uh, So uh, the real reason it's not explored at the moment is that it takes a certain amount of infrastructure cost. Uh, for the you know street signs, the roads, uh, everything to be instrumented, but in the scheme of things, if you think about the you know number of billions and you know nearly trillions that are going to be spent on infrastructure, all the big countries are seriously thinking about it. Uh, then it's not inconceivable that we can put in place technologies like this. And if we did, we would completely uh, you know change the game for the amount of intelligence that's needed. Of course, because there's so much um, computer vision going on at the moment. Is GPS not sufficient then, uh, an up-to-date map and GPS? No, that was the early days. So in the early days, uh, people started out with, you know, I have GPS. And, and in fact, the, the in the beginning, uh, when, when this problem was being looked at, the, the most interesting and exciting area of artificial intelligence that was being applied here was called simultaneous localization and mapping. Can you figure out the map as you're driving? And then having figured out that map, can you figure out where you are on that map? And uh, that that field has grown spectacularly. It's become extremely robust. Uh, but as I was saying at the beginning, that only tells you where is the road and where are you on the road. It doesn't really tell you what's the other car going to do, how should I actually drive, what happens when I get stuck in a roundabout, uh, you know, all of these other things that we teach learner drivers. Um, all of that still needs to be solved. A door in front of it. So the belief would be updated to say that I'm probably here, here, Today we just talk about five rotors or just here. Because otherwise we'll be sitting and here a little bit longer. Then we've got 60 possible positions. One, we've got a two, three out of five, and then they can all go in any slot.